Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, thanks for getting me out of bed at five o'clock in the morning. Um, as a father of two kids, there's nothing more I enjoy than getting up two hours before I have to um, to see you. Uh, it's fantastic. Hopefully, that's what we live for. Um, hopefully, I'll get through this reading without two redheads coming in asking me for Cocoa Pops and stuff like that. But let's let's see what... It's quarter to six now, so we're cutting it fine. We're cutting it fine. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just going to read one poem. And uh, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm going to read all of my poems that I ever wrote. Um, because of lockdown, uh, I should have had a second book by now. My, my second collection, Little Empires, was due out in March. Um, it was one of 15 books, which was um, put back by the publisher. So um, I should actually have physically been in California right now, um, promoting, doing a tour, getting vitamin D, vitamin D. Sorry, I speak American English again. Vitamin D. Um, eating things like kale, which we don't have in Europe. Um, yeah, I know it's a terrible place to live. Social insurance and no kale. But um, anyway, so um, I'm not going to read every poem of the second collection, but um, I am going to read a few poems from the second collection. So this is weird. This is my first ever Zoom reading, and um, it's you know six o'clock in the morning, and nobody can heckle me because you're all on mute. This is yeah. I don't know. You can yeah. You can okay. You can do um, text heckles. Great. <laughs> Not the same, but hopefully I'll be back soon at the Ugly Mug and uh, I can come visit. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is, um, it's how I've been feeling about the, the <laughs> I'm just going to turn off the text. It's how I've been feeling about the news cycles for the last, uh, about the last year. I deleted all the news apps on my phone to help my mental health about six months ago and it's worked. Um, so the first poem is called, We Didn't Read the News. I was at my usual booth half a cold cappuccino in front of me, my daughter crawling over my lap in an attempt to crayon the paper I was reading. The man at the table across the floor looked like the prison warden from the Shawshank Redemption. What's his face? I'd seen him in a few things recently. He smiled, stared just long enough for it not to be awkward, probably had a flashback of his little one doing the same thing some 40 years ago. But his wife lowered her newspaper too and looked over at my daughter, watery-eyed, as if picturing herself at the same age, not a care in the world and more concerned with coloring things in than reading those little black shapes that make everyone angry. Bob Gunton, that was him, the true miscreant of the tale, that character you sit and watch and pray get their comeuppance. I looked down at my table and hoped I hadn't stared back long enough for it to have been awkward. I took my daughter's tiny hand and guided her crayon straight across the front page of the newspaper, carved a waxy orange line through the column about war, added green to the political article, purple to the images of the Wall Street men transfixed by their san sanctity of screens. We took turns shading a bit here, another bit there, exchanging crayons until the prismatic pages began to glow like a city at night, a metropolis viewed from a distant hill where the engorgement of colors is just enough to help us briefly forget about the smaller anger-inducing shapes within. That's the first poem. Cool. Well, this is so far working anyway. Sorry, my voice hasn't even woken up yet. I just, <clears throat> I should have done, um, should have done a, <laughs> a vocal warm-up first. <laughs> it's five in the morning, the end of December. Okay, the second poem I'm going to read um, is also from the second collection. These are all new poems, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to read one familiar one at the end. A hit. <laughs> um, I love it when poems say, uh, poets say that, as if we know. Um, this, um, this is a poem I've actually put to music. I'm, I'm working with a composer in Dublin at the moment. Her name is Una Keen, and she's a... Um, She's a wonderful um, uh, composer, and she's um, donated um, free hoops. Who said free birds? That grace <laughs> must have been. Um, Una Keen, U N A, is an Irish name. Una Keen is this wonderful composer, and she's um, got this beautiful piano piece. Um, I don't know if you can hear that. It's cool, isn't it? 
All right, that's going to be the background. That is the background to the poem. Um, I'm not sure if I can play this because I'm not sure how the, the lyrics will, or the, the voice will sound on it, but um, it is a, it's a nice piece. Hopefully it's going to be a nice production in the end. All right, the poem, um, which is kind of superimposed over the piano piece, is called Michael Stipe Dancing. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, I think this is an appropriate poem for what's happening nowadays, and um, I'll just go ahead and read it. This afternoon is up to nothing. A few locals flitting across the streets like an agitation of dragonflies on stagnant water. Slumber punctuated by the rumble of a tram's almost empty carriage. Arseless benches, faceless cafe windows, We've quarantined ourselves again, angling for agreement that you can't be expected to wear a mask in this heat. Even the birds have fucked off somewhere else. Tenantless trees drooping over a bus stop, dragooning a drunk into deputizing with a song. He obliges. Eyes closed, he begins choreographing a permanent tan into all sorts of shapes. Suddenly, in a slowed down scene, reminiscent of how a movie depicts the stillness of the moment before a bomb, I allow a flashback to play out, remembering a man crush I had on Michael Stipe dancing, spinning, contorting, twisting. A few locals stopped to stare, pretzeled faces like wet cloths wrung, perhaps different memories triggered, relived, missed in these precious seconds. We alchemize these moments, each to their own, mindful of how peace is as shatterable as stagnant water, how just one letter can make laughter slaughter, make the ape the apex, transform something we forge into something we forget, how in a flash it's gone, in each other's eyes, a scatter of birds. So. Sounds much better with the piano music behind it, actually. Um, so I guess, um, just kind of, I'm working on a, three devices here at the moment with two baby monitors plugged into the wall. Um, so I'm very nervous, six o'clock, almost six o'clock. Um, this is my, everybody's written their lockdown poem. Um, I've been, as an Irish person, I've been going nuts for the past. We, we haven't had a, a bar or a cafe open in Vienna since November. Um, and so I, I saw somebody wrote on Twitter, all I, all I want to do is drink a beer outside without my kids watching me, you know? Um, so yeah, I've, I've been that person. Um, See, so this is my lockdown poem. Um, this is called Livestock. Uh, we all know someone somewhere has already written love in a time of corona. Another genius has had the wickedly original idea to dress up for Halloween as COVID-19. My daughter is only five and I'm trying to explain to her why the school is closed, why she can't play with her friends, why the bouncing castle in the mall hasn't been inflated in three weeks, but she's busy teaching her T-Rex manners. Her younger brother, oblivious, is quietly eating the Neutrogena hand cream behind the armchair. Queen Elsa on the TV, neglected. Spring is announced by wild garlic, asparagus, masked shoppers demarcating distance with their eyeballs, daily death tolls hitting the thousand mass graves being dug somewhere in the world. You'd think by now we'd get it. What we're supposed to do, hunker down and wait for the sirens to become less frequent, for the dove to return to the ark with the leaf. The reality in this is the window an inch of disparity between the truth we've built on the inside to what we are told is the truth on the outside, like cattle kicking against the chute, the screws slowly loosening. That, that's me going nuts inside. Thanks. Um, so far, so good. I can hear my son stirring, but um, I usually get another half an hour out of him. <laughs> I honestly thought it was an eight hour time difference. I thought I'll, I'll easily get away with this, sneak back into bed and nobody will know the difference. Ha ha, no way. Okay. 
Um, this this next poem, I am. I actually wrote this before the pandemic started. I was I was before the cafes closed down, before we got scared of each other. Um, I think now it's socially we're a bit weird because we're I don't know about how it is in California, but in, in Central Europe at least, um, you, you you sneeze and you clear the sidewalk. You know, it's it's amazing. Um, I was on the bus the other day. I, I grabbed a croissant from the bakery. Uh, in my haste to get to work and you have to wear a mask on public transport so I was sneakily trying to eat the croissant under the mask you're not allowed to eat on public transport anyway so I was you know lifting my mask taking a bite and trying to swarf this croissant then I started choking on the crumbs and everybody got off the next stop um so it's a bit weird um and there's me trying to say in German it's just a croissant it's just a croissant um <laughs> but it's just weird how uh, we're a bit afraid of each other but anyway about a, a year and a little bit ago I was in a cafe and um, there was a woman standing on her seat in the cafe so I wrote a poem with a really original title called woman standing on her seat in a cafe behind me in the cafe there's a crazy woman standing on her seat jacket buttoned to the top hood pulled up she's ambulance white joyless as a ward of winters gauging how far her virus might spread if she sneezes she's talking to jesus or someone in the control tower a terrorist cell in a cave whispering when to detonate every passing customer has their own theory glancing subtly avoiding full eye contact lest she burst into song a bible passage a hex handed down by a generation of black magic practitioners lest her eyes glow red her lips recede to reveal fangs a forked tongue maybe blood she could be patient zero, the self-anointed chosen one, the preacher who glitzes us all into drinking the Kool-Aid. Someone must have reported her by now, got through to the hotline you call in a situation like this and explained there's a woman standing on her seat in the cafe. She's lost the plot, lost her marble. She's dingling, batshit, non-compost mentis, one sandwich short of a picnic. The voice on the other end of the line might ask him, what exactly is she doing? And the caller will roll their eyes because it's obvious she's about to bring down the building. She's standing on her seat. She's standing on her seat in the cafe. So I think that's how we feel about each other these days. Um, that was very prophetic of me to write something like that. Um, but there you go. Um, okay. What will I read next? This is an Irish poem. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to uh, it's going to going to go down like a fart in a spacesuit, as my friend once said. Um, <laughs> aren't they all Irish poems? Only with my accent. Um, but um, the summer, I, I've been writing a lot from memory these days because part of my influence is always being around people. That's what I loved about the mug. I had this ritual with. Uh, with Graham Smith just to go to uh, what was that bar called down the road um, gastro pub um, somebody will put it into chat the haven thank you I had a ritual of just hanging out in the haven with Graham Smith talking poetry and then walking up the streets going to the mug listening to all you beautiful people talk who it's by the way it's great to see familiar faces and to meet new ones as well um, and so that that's always been the the inspiration for me as a poet just to be out and among people and so I haven't had that opportunity in the last, you know, 12 months. Um, and so I've been writing a lot from memory. And this poem um, is a poem about um, uh, the summer I turned 18. I worked in a quarry. Um, so there's actually two poems connected here. One of them um, is from my first book. It's the only poem I'll read from this book. It's called uh, Stop Gap Grace. Um, nothing to do with Grace Samora, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but um, the poem, the first poem of the, 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 that I'll read um, is another really um, original title. It's called The Quarry, and it's about working in a quarry. And the second poem is also about a quarry. And here's the link to the Shawshank Redemption, which was in another poem. Um, shut up, Neil, and read. Okay. The Quarry. Christ, we won't have a bomb at all. That's Irish for, oh my God, we won't have any money. Christ, <laughs> Christ, we won't have a bomb at all. 
Junior proclaimed the last three words of his declaration rolling out as one. It had become every man's catchphrase on wet days, peering out from a rusting metal container unit at a disemboweled stomach of wet rock. Sinners did not pick stones in the rain, which was why we wouldn't have a bob at all. There was no poters, posters of Rita Hayworth to adorn the walls of our asylum, and every coming Saturday night felt more like the chalky promise of parole. That summer took longer than most. Ten hours a day knelt in prayer with hammer and stone, feeling no remorse at using the Lord's name in vain every time the chisel slipped. Broken scabs and bloodied hands, as if two nails had been driven into each. But wouldn't himself be along shortly, over the brow of the hill in his new Pajero, stone mad, blaspheming the Trinity to find out why we weren't on our knees. He would, and by God we'd tell him where to go with his productivity, and he wouldn't be long buzzing up those electric windows driving off out the gap. Christ, you've catch your death in that. That's Irish for, oh my God, we're going to get so sick because of this weather. Christ, you'd catch your death in that. Junior decreed an act of unparalleled ventriloquism, his mouth combating both a swig of lilt and a fig roll. This was not a screen, this was not a scene scripted by Stephen King, nor was it a movie narrated by Morgan Freeman, and it didn't matter a shit to Junior that he wasn't Andy Dufresne quarrying himself to some eventual freedom. So that's the that's the first poem of the the Jew. I'll write a trilogy of poems about quarries. I'll be the first person in the world to write poems about quarrying. Um, quarry is the same word in American English, right? Just go, yeah, okay, cool. I'm a bit conscious of that, um, the vocabulary. Um, so the next poem um, is about my boss in the quarry. His name was Donald Regan. Um, and he had this weird voice. He, it was like he was missing th things in his, fr his throat. He was just, oh, hey. was just, <laughs> he's a weird man. A uh, place to cut stone. Yeah, thanks. Um, so that was my first job. It was a place to cut your hands as well and your conscience um, and your faith. <laughs> Quarries cut a lot of things. All right, anyway, the second poem is about my boss. I'm not sure if I can actually read this in Ireland because he's still alive, you know, and he's still... He's still around. Anyway, it's called The Day I Nearly Killed Don Regan with the Bucket of a JCB. It's a digger. The Day I Nearly Killed Don Regan with the Bucket of a JCB had actually started well. A 7, am, a 7 a.m. cycle through Myris Wood, out past Renine at full tide, trees electric with waking birds, tractors dieseling along the lanes to a creamery on its last legs. Verdant hedgerows thick with that baited combination of nettles and blackberries, honeysuckle and briars, a spangle of spiderwebs glistening the dew, stitching them all together. That the measure of a real man was the ability to run a loaded wheelbarrow up the plank of a wood into the back of a trailer is the memory I can't easily forget. I could say the same for Donal Regan's eyes when the teeth of the bucket of the JCB I was driving came through the window of the cab of the digger he was sitting in. That was all 18 years of me trying to prove I had more to offer the world than a wheelbarrow and a plank. I don't remember much else about that summer, about that job, apart from my daily cycle and one particular incident that went unpunished. But if I quarry deep enough, I still find that younger version of myself in a broken pair of boots, ripped jeans, cut hands, shaking on a bed of slate, doing his best to drown out the sounds of engines growling, glass cracking, steel scraping off of steel, listening instead to the call of a corn crake in the adjacent field, announcing his departure. So anyway, that's the quarry poems. Um, I got these ideas from a brilliant poet. If you ever get the chance to, to read or to listen to uh, this poet, Michael McGriff, Mike McGriff, his name is. Um, he's a, he came to, to read in Vienna a couple of years ago and we've been friends since, but he, I think he's based out of uh, Moscow, Idaho. Um, but he's, uh, his latest, he, he was a hilarious conversation we had um, about six months ago. Uh, he woke up in the morning and uh, his phone rang and it was Billy Collins. 
um, just to say, oh, by the way, you've just won, um, <laughs> you've just won this prize for this award for this book. Oh, thanks, Billy. <laughs> and that was that. That's that's all he had to say. He's a very humble man. Um, but his latest collection is fantastic. Um, I have it here somewhere, but I don't want to jinx it and open the door. Um, so here's a poem about genes. Um, I'm, I'm going to read like two, two or three more, and then uh, and then shut up. Um, that's okay with you. Um, this is a poem about genes. Um, just to have a bit of a segue between Ireland and the United States, because I did live in Los Angeles for four years, and then I came back for another eight months in the OC, um, living in Irvine, Wednesday night at the Mug. That really saved my life. I tell you, <laughs> get me out of. Irvine. No offense if you live in Irvine, it's just there was nothing for me there. Um, sorry, Hannah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyway, um, this poem is called Goodwill Jeans. Full offense to Irvine. Um, <laughs> I can say this because my wife is asleep now. She can't hear me talking about Irvine, so trap me in Irvine. Um, this poem is called Goodwill Jeans. The summer I turned 15, I took a day trip to Cork city in Ireland, on my own, armed with a few pounds that I'd saved from a dishwashing job. I made a beeline for Carey's Lane where I stopped to worship the buskers. Then I drifted among the vintage shops, not knowing how or why I had developed a preference for secondhand clothes. Maybe the wind chimes, the smell of patchouli, sandalwood, or the grateful dead making malleable shapes in my head. In the fitting room in goodwill, I slip into another man's life, hoist his journey over my thighs, button him around my waist. He walks me onto the shop floor, does a twirl in front of the mirror, assures me that for 20 bucks, I can ride shotgun for a year, see the city the way he used to, exchange stories one ghost to another. I take him up on his offer, glide an allied resurrection out the door into a city where a million people look straight through me. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I have to do what Ben does and say, this is the poem before the end of the poem or something like that is now. So I'll just do two more. Um, let me just do one more. Oh yeah. Got a haircut yesterday. Um, I was very excited. I don't know, again, like in the States, I hear you have to present a negative test. It's a bit weird. You have to show them a negative Corona test for a haircut. The same day you can go to the dentist and show them nothing. Um, and these people are actually in your mouth with their hands. Um, <laughs> the logic, the logic of this kind of defies me, but um, it is what it is. So um, I've just got to scroll to see if I can find a poem about haircuts. If I can't find it, I'm not going to read it. Simple as that. Um, they all had haircuts recently, with the exception of uh, Michael Canton and Steve Ramirez, I can see you all, you all look very handsome and, and well put together. Um, so yeah, it's a bit, I don't know, I think you take your life into your own hands when you, when you go for a haircut in a country where you don't really speak the language. Um, it's one of those things you have to do once in your life, you know, just see, see if you can communicate what you want uh, to get done. Um, yeah, I can't find it now, can I? Hang on now. Um, here we go. Sorry about this. I'm, I've got a, I'm not as, um, what's the word, technically savvy as, uh, as some of you might be. Here we are. So anyway, here's the poem about haircuts. It's a short poem and it's called Scapegoat. I've made my comparisons. I've read up on how much the ice caps are melting per year. I've looked at the rate of retreat of the glaciers and I've come to the finite conclusion that global warming is also to blame for my receding hairline. What can we do for you today? Carol asked in German, jacking the chair so that my head was at operating level. I need you to make me look like Ryan Gosling, I replied in really bad German. I smiled, but secretly hoped our exchange via the mirror would lead to her saying, I got this. 
She begins with the comb and proposes how much to cut by sliding two fingers scissor-like into my scalp. But these days I schedule haircuts anytime the gray becomes too much. When I need her to trim a few years off the sides and make what's weighing me down from above manageable. So that's the haircut poem. That's exactly what happened yesterday. I don't know if you think I look like Ryan Gosling. It's too early. <laughs> I don't know, some people, they just have no humor whatsoever, especially the, the hairdressers in Austria. I think the Austrians in general kind of lack humor or it's just my bad German, 100% Daniel. Like, you know. So anyway, okay. Um, so I'm gonna just read one more. Um, I, the, um, I read this poem in the mug. I don't remember when, two years ago when I was the sorbet. Um, thanks, Patrick. Um, <laughs> so yeah, two years ago, I had a spontaneous visit to the mug. We were just back on vacation and I escaped Irvine once more just for, for an evening in Orange. And um, as soon as Steve Ramirez saw me coming in the door, I was going to be the sorbet, um, which, was, which was nice of him to, uh, <laughs> to introduce me as that. So this is a poem, I am, because I lived, I lived in uh, Frank, just off of Franklin Village in Los Angeles in uh, in Beechwood Drive. Um, it was quite a place to, to hang out uh, for an Irishman. Um, I'm kind of naive when it comes to celebrities and who's who. Um, I'm not a big television fan. Um, it's interesting, like when, when we're out with my wife in, in Hollywood and there was somebody in the cafe, my wife suddenly went into hieroglyphics. She's, she's, and I was trying to lip read. You know the way people talk to each other when you don't want to just, talk normally instead of <laughs> I have no idea who that is anyway so I met Ron Perlman um, in Gelson's once um, and I just had this fantasy about like what if Ron Perlman was looking at me thinking that is that Neil oh my god it's the poet it's the I know him so that was the fantasy I had um this is called Checking Out Eggs with Ron Perlman. What's the likelihood, I ask you, that Ron Perlman recognized me as I was ambling my way along the cheeses, past the cured meats towards the open cooler of eggs and milk and even more cheese? Do you think for a second he did a double take, hovered by the pyramid of mangoes and waited for me to turn around and suddenly reveal my strikingly familiar but can't quite put a name on face? Perhaps, had I been born a beautiful woman with sultry looks, buoyant locks, waking each morning to the thrill of who might spot me in Gelson's, I would be there having sterile wiped my shopping cart Drifting seamlessly from the organic vegetables to the dairy, Ron Perlman would turn and glance, two ripe mangoes in his hands, a blast of cold air from the cooler, just enough to make my nipples poke out of my sleeveless Fred Seagal blouse. Ron Perlman would put his mangoes back and move closer to the free range eggs. Aren't you, he would stutter, falling short of a name and regretting his impulsive decision. Yes, I am, I would quickly reply, saving him the awkwardness of the situation. The conversation, of course, would begin with eggs and, and everybody's awake all of a sudden. Can you hear that? <laughs> okay, this is the last poem. Stay with me, Jonah. Um, Aren't you, he would stutter, falling short of a name and regretting his impulsive decision. Yes, I am, I would quickly reply, saving the awkwardness of the situation. The conversation would begin with eggs and move to work with compliments thrown at random at my latest projects, his latest projects, and maybe a casting director or two that we had in common because we both thought they were complete dicks. The next day he'd call to my condo and I'd meet and greet him with something vintage playing in my vintage record player, invite him in and wait for him to admire my Jonifer Adler this and my Jonathan Adler that. I would have pre-prepared a salad of goat's cheese and apricots and he'd joke, but no eggs. And we'd both laugh nervously at something that wasn't funny. Not beating around the bush and giving in to my own impulsiveness, I'd lean forward and touch his hand and say, 
You recognized me yesterday, Ron. You did, and that made my day. You need to recognize people. You do, Ron, Ron, Ron. You do, Ron, Ron. And he'd laugh nervously at a joke that wasn't all funny as something vintage clicked to an awkward stop. Anyway, thanks for listening to me and thanks for having me. It's really good to kind of reconnect. And um, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Ben. And um, thank you. Thanks for joining. <laughs>